And then for those of you guys don't, who don't have questions, uh, we can just start asking some questions that you guys will probably all be facing as well. Awesome. So uh, the recording is now live. No, we can take it away. All right, hey everyone, this is Neil. Uh, today we're gonna be going over any questions you guys have from module one, as well as any questions you just have in general about SEO or even if it's about marketing or anything like that, feel free to ask away and I'm here to help you out as well as other team members. Uh, right now we have Carlos, Derek, Vignesh and I, and we're all here to answer any questions you guys have about anything pretty much marketing related. Yeah, so we have our first question. Uh, it's from Joe. He's raised his hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute Joe, and he's going to ask his question. Joe, you cool. are. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, Joe. Hey, so uh, I, I'm going to be doing, I, I mean, I, I've already done SEO at consulting as my business, but I've been doing more. Let's, I've been very sloppy with it, let's, let's just say the least. And I've been doing quote unquote gray hat SEO where now I'm trying to go completely 100% white hat. And that's why I'm in this course. But right now I'm finding I'm, I'm marketing to to companies. But I, since I was so sloppy before, I don't have any hard stats from from Google Search Console or analytics. Uh, how do you get around like I know I'm a capable of doing it. How do I get around that that speed bump or that that obstacle? Or should I start a test case website and then just kind of go from there? So I, I'm a bit confused on what you're asking, Joe. Okay, so you used to do black hat or gray hat or whatever you want to call it SEO, mm -hmm. and now you're doing white hat. You sell to companies and you offer consulting services, correct? Correct. And what you're trying to say is, how do you give case studies and show results to new potential customers so they sign up? Yeah, and part of my issue was is I was very disorganized and I was dealing with smaller clients. So as long as they were seeing more leads, they didn't care. So I don't have any hard stats from, let's say, analytics or search console. So how do I get around that speed bump of getting to that next tier client? without having those stats handy yet. You don't need those stats. So I've pitched SEO for ages. When I first started, I was 16. Keep in mind, I was so young, who would pay a 16 year old $100,000 a year to do their SEO, right? And I was doing this as a consultant. Um, what I ended up learning was, whatever stats you have, sharing that is enough. So uh, for example, Let's say you're working with, you're, you're trying to pitch, what, what's the next bigger size client you would pitch? So like currently, uh, I, I want to start targeting like dentists, cosmetic surgery, you know, high ticket items. Right now I'm doing an, like right now, the only client I have left is an insurance agent. And I know that I've grown them from three contacts a month to about 40 to 50. So let, let's say with the dentist, I would then end up going and being like, um, Hey, you know what we are, and are you doing cold outreach? Or are they coming to you? Uh, well, they're doing uh, right now. I'm doing cold outreach, but once I start doing the white hat SEO on my, on my own website, they'll be coming to me hopefully. Okay, so once you have people coming to you, the thing you want to end up doing is explaining to them, hey, this is why you need it. This is the value in it. Here's the traffic that other people in your space are generating. Here's the rough estimate of the traffic value. You can get all that data from SEMrush. But it sounds like your big concern is how do you show them the value when you did black hat in the past and how do you make them believe that you can do it when you're doing white hat right now? Um, and the big thing is, is people who are gonna be hiring you don't really know much about SEO. I wouldn't get into the details about your past, about black hat or white hat or any of that. It just creates confusion. You know that you're you've turned over a new leaf and you're gonna do white hat SEO. All my pitches usually when I deal with companies, if you're dentists and stuff like that, they're still smaller size or plastic surgeons. It's like, look, a lead is worth a lot to you. Here's the cost per click on Google. As you can see, it's increasing over time. You already know it works. Everyone in your space works. 
you guys yourselves are doing the paid ads because those are the best ones, right? They feel the pain. Why would you want to be ranked organically when 70% of the people click organically? And you can just Google something like Google organic uh, CTR rate, right? And there's like a lot of uh, articles and graphs that break down the percentage. So if you're getting this much volume from paid, imagine how much you can get from organic and not pay for it. Here's what I did for someone in the insurance space. As you know, insurance is worth a lot of money. Just look at Berkshire Hathaway. I took them from three leads to 40 leads a month. And I've done this countless number of times. And you give a few more case studies, right? The question is, you know, do you want to keep paying per click or do you want to do something about it, right? And if they start giving you objections like, oh, what other results and stuff have you done in this space? And be like, I haven't done other stuff in your space exactly. SEO is the same. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's an algorithm. It's Google. But I've already done it in the high ticket item spaces and I've done well. And I've just shown you like things like insurance. Now, the question is, is do you want more leads or do you want to keep paying for leads, right? At a costly basis each and every single month and have the cost continually rise. And as you're discussing them, they may give you another objection, such as, oh, you know, like, uh, you know, how do you differ between the bigger companies? And you can say, you know what the difference between the bigger companies is? One, they charge a lot more. Two, they don't give you personalized experience. And three, they put junior interns and reps on your account. And you can just go to like Craigslist and find like, let's say a job posting for iProspect or whoever it may be that's big. Like, here's an example, iProspect. They're one of the biggest in this space. Look at the type of people that are working on accounts. They're putting $30,000, $40,000 a year recent college graduates on accounts like Coca-Cola. What do you think is going to happen when you start working with one of the bigger agencies? Sure, this is what's happening with someone who's big. You may think, oh, maybe I should work with the mid-tier. You think the mid-tiers aren't doing anything different? What sets my agency apart from others is I personally work on your account. You deal with me. I'm good at what I do, right? And that's why you get results. Go look out there and see what results people like iProspect are providing each and every single day. People are pissed. Why? Because these marketing interns aren't providing results. So it's not too hard to close these deals. It's taking the opposite. So whatever you are, whatever your weaknesses are, you make them your strengths. Whatever your strengths are, you make them your, or whatever other people's strengths are, you make them their weakness. For example, if I was iProspect, I'd be like, do you really want to work with Joe? He's a one-man shop. Look at the brands he's worked with. Look at us. We've worked all the, all these brands. Sure. And if, if Joe goes back to them and Joe says, oh, but they we're having all these interns work on our account, they're like, yeah, we have all these interns working on your account. But if it wasn't producing results, do you think we would be this big of a company? Right? Do you see how you can play both sides of it? Yeah. Yeah, That's no, that. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I, I was just afraid, I, maybe it's a mental block. I was just afraid that like the little stats I did have weren't enough to sell someone on my capabilities. You think it's little. A uh, plastic surgeon who's getting 10 leads a month doesn't think it's little. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I think right now that's that's the one question I had that was burning in my head. Cool, perfect. Awesome. So thank you, Joe, for that awesome question. Uh, if anyone, again, wants to ask a question, they have to raise their hand or type it in the chat. I'll unmute your mic, and you can talk to Neil personally, and uh, you can ask your question. Uh, I have the next person. His name is David. He's already uh, asked this question. So, David, I'm going to unmute your mic, and you can ask your question to Neil. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. how are you guys doing? Um, so I run a small e-commerce website selling uh, yoga wear, so active wear and stuff, um, more of a fashion type brand. Uh, what uh, how Lulu, SEO? Uh, also being worn anytime, correct? Sorry? Kind of like a Lululemon. Yes. Um, what kind of SEO tips would you, uh, would you suggest uh, or give us um, since we're a fashion brand? Uh, yeah. You mind me asking how big you are? Uh, we're really small. We're a small, uh, small one brand. Like less than a million a year in sales? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how much does it cost to produce a product? 
produce. Uh, yeah. Say ten bucks. Okay. Do you guys have enough funding where you can give away like a thousand dollars worth of product? Yeah. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Okay. So here's the thing, and I learned this the hard way. Um, what I would end up doing is I would first go to Instagram, and I know this isn't SEO, but it'll work. I would first go to Instagram and find every person who's into yoga and fitness and have them wear your pants, just talking about how it's the most comfortable yoga pants or yoga tops or yoga sports bras or whatever it is, right? Yeah. You'll get some sales from that. Yeah. But what you find is as more people end up talking, and you can actually generate a cash flow positive business just from that. I know a lot of people, there was one like Hex Ties, they generated it was either three or $5 million in sales by just giving away people ties on Instagram. Um, but here's what I do. I would do twofold. One, I would try that out because what will end up happening is it'll create brand awareness. And the more people that know your brand, they'll type it into Google and it creates sales. Yeah. Okay. Number two. Okay. Uh, let's see how I can pull this up. Uh, and yeah, so the brand awareness part is you do the brand stuff. People get type in your brand name, your ranking starts skyrocketing and you should get sales directly from the Instagram. Um, how do I share my screen, Big Nash? Webcams, share my webcam, no. Um, I'm, I'm just this? gonna give you presenter rates and you should be able to share it momentarily. There we go. My main screen, yeah, what else do I have? Okay, Sunny Co Clothing. Have you heard of Sunny Co Clothing, David? Uh, no. You see the spike right here in Google Trends? Yes. That's them being extremely popular. Do you know why they got that? Giveaway? No. Uh, yes, but they did it really smart. H how much does it cost to ship your pants? Um, say 20 bucks. Including shipping? Yeah, for, for, uh, for, ex for express shipping, we usually charge 20. For normal shipping, we charge 10 bucks. Okay. We're, yeah, our warehouse is in China. So here's Sunny Clothing. You need to figure out better ways to work on your shipping costs. I would try to get that down because it shouldn't cost 20 bucks a ship, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, Sunny Clothes Clothing, in, insane Instagram giveaway chaos. These guys did a lot wrong. This, is, this article is, I don't think is that great because um, they don't have data to back it up. Okay, this is probably hard to read. Sharing is caring. Everyone that reposts and tags us in this picture within the next 24 hours will receive a free Pamela Sunny suit. Offer only valid promo and blah, blah, blah. Must pay for shipping and handling. Okay? Yeah. If you do it where you're just giving away free yoga gear and they just pay shipping and handling, and let's say they pay 15 bucks because you figure out how to get your cost down on producing it. You do shipping for $10 or whatever, and you're just charging 15 bucks. And I'm assuming you're producing high quality yoga pants like Lululemon, right? Yeah. And let's say you do that. This goes viral because who doesn't want stuff for free? Then I would then take that and then on your checkout page, have a checkout bump. Are you familiar with a checkout bump? Uh, no. Okay, so let's go to Quick Funnels. They usually have checkout bumps. They may not, you know, on the current web version. Okay, so let me buy Quick Funnels. Jared. Hey, Nicole. Hi. Go. So, look what I found. What is this? Click funnels. What's okay. ClickFunnels? It's for our online business. But, but we already have like a website and Facebook. Why do we need a funnel? But, but that's so confusing. Our customers come and... Let's see. I will find this for you. There's a checkout bump. Okay. So here's an example of a checkout bump. So when you buy, it's loading up. You put in and it says, ship me the book. 
one-time payment, want our conversion crusher video sales letter template, it's proven that works easy to solve, click, just click yes, uh, now for $37, right? Yeah. So what he's doing there, and this works extremely well, is, and this works really well, even better for tangible goods like clothing, uh, protein powder, supplements, whatever you want, right? I've seen it work. In which when someone's buying a free giveaway, it says, yes, would you also like a hoodie and a jacket? It's normally $97 um, or yoga socks or whatever. You can get it now. It's one time special offer for half off. So once you start doing that, you start getting a lot more sales in other ways. Yeah. In addition to that, what you'll notice, in addition to that, what you'll also notice is then upon checkout after they get you do a one-click upsell. One-click upsell is right when they buy. The next page is, hey, would you also like two yoga pants and all of this? You know, normally they cost $70. We can't keep giving them away for free. But because it's crazy and we're having a you know special giveaway because of Instagram, we'll give it to you for 40, 50, 60% off. Yeah. You can generate a ton of sales and be really profitable doing that. Okay. Um, so we actually have been doing, working with a lot of influencers on Instagram uh, to create, as you say, brand awareness. Um, we, and we also have been planning on the uh, free giveaway where we offer uh, a pair of tights for free uh, with the price of shipping. Basically, um, and then you can do a checkout bump and one click upsell. Yeah, we haven't, we have, I haven't looked into that, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot for, for that advice. Um, because I'll definitely look it's then profitable, right? You want to make a lot of money. The goal is to just give shit away and break yeah. even or make a little bit of money. Okay, okay. Here's what people forget to tell you the hardest part about marketing and sales especially with online transactions, is getting someone to swipe in their credit card and buy something. The moment you get them to buy, it's really easy to get them to buy more. To give you a rough number, out of all the people that buy, 10 to 15% should do this checkout bump, 20% should do the one-click upsell. Okay. If you're not in those rough percentages, that means your offer isn't good enough. It could be the price, it could be what you're offering, it could be the pitch, it could be the copy. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the, how about the SEO content marketing bit, bit of, um, of it? And what, kind of, what kind of stuff I can do to improve, uh, to get more exposure in terms of organic traffic from Google? What are you doing right now? Are we writing blogs on, on like fitness, workout, this type of stuff? But it doesn't seem to get a lot of traffic. And uh, after after learning your uh, the first module, uh, lesson two and one, lesson one and two, I started looking more on keywords, uh, on forums. But um, yeah, I can't seem to find too much on these type of topic. Uh, or maybe I'm not looking into it deep enough. Yeah. So. Let's see what people type in related to yoga. I'm gonna type in, oh, there you go, it loads up. Um, yoga poses, yoga mat. Do um, you guys sell yoga mats as well? No, we don't sell yoga mats. <clears throat> yoga pants, yoga pants with pockets, yoga pants for men, yoga pants song, I don't even know what that is. Yo-Yo Pants and Lululemon. Um, what else do you guys sell that's yoga related? Sports bras. Yoga bras, uh, yoga bras sell, okay? So check this out. Let's see what results they have for yoga pants. Look at these number of social shares. Think the lot. It's yoga fan season. These yoga fans don't leave much to imagination. It's all sex related. <laughs> uh, women yoga fans. Uh, these yoga fans don't leave much. 
Oh, that's really cool. Look at this, 12 best yoga pants for every body. Okay, not everyone is super skinny and fit, right? Yeah. People have different body types. For example, my mom is probably gonna wear different yoga pants compared to a fitness model. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, so this article right here, I don't think they did as good of a job because they didn't talk about plus size people, people with bigger thighs, people with bigger calves, et cetera, right? Maybe a bit here, but you can end up doing the best yoga pants for each, you know, body type. Um, and then the cool part about that is what you can end up doing is you can promote other people's services or I mean other people's products, but promote your products when it is a good fit. And you create content like that that can go viral. Like it just shows you people want really good yoga pants for their body type. Okay. So you, did, did you mean that I can I write, write blog about other people's products as well? On yoga pants at all? Is that what you mean? Well, if you write a post, let's say the 21 yes best yoga pants, depending on your body type, or the 21 best yoga pants for every body type, right? Yeah. You're not going to end up being able to promote your product in all 21 ways because that would just be biased. Yes. Even if you have an amazing product, do you agree that if you say your yoga pants is the best one for 21 different body types, you would pretty much be lying? You would agree yes. with that, correct? Yes, yeah. But you probably have better yoga pants than most people for some of the body types, correct? Yeah then for those body types you should show your yoga pant product that you can sell and then for the other body types show your competitor ones and you can even use the affiliate link the reason i'm saying you want to end up doing this is when you write about fitness articles like do better in the gym how to do better yoga poses and you could write articles on that it's less likely to lead to a sale yeah versus when you talk about 21 best yoga pants for every body type, then people will start buying it based on their body type. You get what I mean? Yep. Okay. Okay, thanks, thank you, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, you can even write articles talking about yoga clothing. You know how some people wear really bright yoga clothes versus some people don't, right? Yep. You can even talk about like, I don't know the good, a good title for this, but something related to mix and matching styles. Like how do you find your own style? How do you mix and match? Should you be bright or should you be non-bright? And how to mix and match. And then you can show examples of what looks good together and how to be like out of the box and stand out. Yeah. And then from there, you can link them to products that they can buy that you guys also sell. Okay. Yeah, that's quite interesting because uh, I've never thought of, uh, I, I never thought I'd be able to write blog on other people's, uh, on other businesses, yoga pants, uh, with affiliate links as well. Um, yeah, that's something. Yeah, Sorry? I was just saying, why not, right? Okay. As in you can, but yeah, you, you got to write. Awesome. Um, Jared, uh, you had some thoughts as well? Yeah, uh, I was wondering what platform are you on? What platform? Uh, I'm on open cart right now. Open cart, okay, that's a little tricky. How many SKUs do you have? As, how many SKU? We currently have around 64. 64, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for open card, I'm not quite sure, you know, as far as developing the pre-purchase order bump page, that's going to be like your easiest bet, um, for some quick wins on sales. Um, but it's going to have to be custom development, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We have an IT guy behind working with us. Um, yeah. So what I'd say though, is like, you need really good examples to send it to your developers, right? For e-commerce. And I think the person who's probably doing the best development around pre-purchase order bump pages and post-purchase one-click upsells 
is a company called Zipify Apps, and they mostly do it for Shopify. But at the very least, you can Google them, look at what they're doing, and send it over to your developers. Um, let's see, two weeks ago, my wife and I, we own a skincare company, and it's on Magento. And we just installed a pre-purchase order bump page um, to our store. And you can actually test it out if you want. It's a really good example, I think, of um, how to at least start with pre-purchase order bump pages. The URL is skincarebyalana, A-L-A-N-A dot com. And all you need to do is add to cart, and then the pre-purchase order bump page should pop up for you. Uh, we started doing this in, um. within the first... What, one minute, Jared. Uh, do you want to share your screen and show him stuff? Yeah, that would be sure. awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to yeah, yeah. Try. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. See. Yeah, no problem. I can walk you through this. Even after the call, you can email me with any questions about this. But what I wanted to say is, like, within the first week, it in, we got about $1,000 in additional sales for our own product line, which was the goal, just from installing this page. And the funny thing was, um, I was worried that this pre-purchase order bump page was going to decrease my conversion rate because you never really want to like get in the way of someone putting in their credit card, like Neil says. As, as a heads up, not really. Your screen. Can you guys see? Yeah, that? I don't see your screen. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. You're either going to see. I have like three screens up, so I just want to make sure you see my wife's website. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing it. Skincare by Atlanta. Cool. So I'm going to um, add a product to cart. You know what? I need to do this through a private window because we actually cookie people so they only see it. Um, they only see it once every 30 days so they don't get overwhelmed. It actually increased our conversion rate. So that was pretty cool. I'm not really sure why, but it did. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the page. Add a product to cart. And then I click on my cart. And here is a good example of a pre-purchase order bump page. Can you see that? Yes. So for e-commerce, like the ClickFunnels one, that's like going to work, you know, but uh, we're seeing a lot of success right now with kind of like a longer form sales page. And what I've done that I think is a little bit innovative that I would highly suggest is we have a smoking offer up here. And by the way, I did some research. This is my highest converting product that I'm offering them at an extra 10% off. Yep. So at the bottom, I give them the option to add all the offers to the cart. So literally they can add all these 25% off, 25% off, 10% off. Now these products don't cost me very much to produce, right? So yep. like even at 25% off, I'm still making a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, I've increased the average order size of their purchase by like, I don't know, what is that, like 100 bucks or something? <laughs> and yeah. it's awesome. Okay. And, and Jared, how much more is this making you on average per sale? Yeah, it increased my average order size like $20, like the moment I turned it on. And I haven't even gotten to like go in and refine it yet. I was so stoked. So at $20, what was it before? Oh gosh, I think it was about seventy dollars. So that's a nice increase, right? You pretty much got a, I think it's like twenty-eight, thirty percent, or something like that increase. It completely like boosted my entire business. This one page, this one tip that Neil just told you. Yeah. So that's not even like going to say about the post-purchase one-click upsell, which is a complete other boost. And so I'd encourage you to check out an awesome example of that on Zipify pages. They have a great little video about it. And then the other thing is what people also forget is after the sale is all done, and Neil was probably going to get into this too, so I hope I'm not cutting you off on it. You have a thank you confirmation page, correct? Yes. Thank you for your order, blah, blah, blah. This is like the most precious real estate because that person just spent money on your cart. We have the most qualified person for your business looking at this page because they've already spent money. So why not make them another offer there? Okay. 
And what do you do on your thank you page, Jared? Yeah, so on my thank you page right now, it's kind of similar to our pre-purchase order bump page, but I actually use a countdown timer, right? So increasing scarcity and increasing a sense of urgency. We throw down that countdown timer and we say, hi, you know, thank you. My name's Elena. Thank you so much for your purchase. And actually, I have another deal for you. Um, purchase this within the next 15 minutes and our countdown timer says 15 minutes. And maybe that time's too long. I don't know. Maybe it should be five, but I wanted to, our, our demographic is kind of like a little bit more mature, like women. So I want to give them plenty of time to go back and take up on the deal. Add this eye cream now onto your order and you'll get it at 50% off, blah, 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 right? So it's a very simple offer that gives them a limited amount of time to go and actually repurchase. And it's so funny, I think one out of every 10 or 20 purchases actually take us up on the deal. And so for us, it's awesome because we still make a little more money. I kind of, in another way, increase my average order size if you count the fact that they placed two orders, but you know, instead they were gonna place one if they never saw my confirmation page, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it all adds up, so for him, Five to ten percent of his customers are taking him up on the thank you page offer. That gets into the one-click upsells. The same thing. They buy something, you show them something on the thank you page. But yeah, just doing this, it's a great way to just generate extra revenue from your existing customers or your visitors. Yeah. Okay. Um, Neil, I got one more question. Yeah, fire away. Okay. Um uh, you were mentioning about the giveaway and uh, the shipping. Uh, how long do you, would you do that for? And how often would you do that for? So well, I, everything I research, because I have friends who've tested this out a lot too. If you do it yeah. for too long, like you do a giveaway for a whole month, it's not as effective. If you do it for a shorter period of time, you get way more results. Yeah, your total volume may not be as greater, but you get way more people sharing within like 24 hours or 48 hours. And that causes everyone to start doing it and it creates that virality and creates all those brand queries in Google and people talking about you. Okay. And how, how many times would you, would you uh, suggest to do that a, a year, in a year? Oh, I would try to do something monthly. Okay. But with a new product each time, you know what I mean? You can't use the same one every month. Okay. Awesome. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Jared, thanks, uh, Neil. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, that's good. We have the next question from Colin. Colin, I'm gonna be unmuting you. If you can explain the question to Neil, uh, we can get that answered for you. Colin, please take it away. Hey, okay. Colin. All right, it's green now. Hey, Neil, how are you doing? Good. Um, so, a different sort of question. What I want to yeah. do is a lot more consultancy for reasonably large listed corporates. And the theme that I want to consult them on is around how having a purpose beyond profit may well be beneficial for them in terms of making more profit. Wait, wait, can, okay, so you have a consultancy, correct? Yeah. Okay, so you have a consultancy uh, and you offer marketing services. No, not really marketing. Um, the consultancy is really focused on helping corporates to innovate faster, to be more agile, uh, to act more like a startup. Got it. So your program is you help corporations innovate, uh, grow faster, execute faster, you help teams align, communicate better, etc. stuff like that. But it's all stuff around like that. So Exactly. You know, so at a, at a high level, helping you think differently, helping you do differently, um, and then showing you some 
methods where you can actually go off and and uh, apply that. And a lot of it is about showing corporates how they can apply it because there's so many blockers in the corporate. You know, legacy corporates have got so much resistance to change. It's really showing them how to go and break those blockers. Okay. And my question is that, uh, I mean, this is something I've done for many years internally for the corporates that I've worked for. I'm doing it now more for uh, corporates which are clients of the company that I work for. And I'm now moving into starting to do this by myself, for myself, so I, I get paid directly for it uh, rather than coming through on a salary. In doing so, I've started to set up the websites, but my very first stumbling block or question is, I don't know whether to brand it as a company or to put it under my own name. I get varying responses, and I don't know if that makes any difference from an SEO perspective either. So I can either go oh. colonisles.com or purposefulorganisations.com do you have any advice on either of those choices? Okay, so I can give you actually the right answer for this, but I would have to ask you some questions if you don't mind sharing some financials. Because based on that, I can tell you what to do so that way you don't make this mistake. I've been in your shoes before. Um, so first off, the company you work for, how much revenue do you think they do in total? Well, I work for a um, major bank, so you know they make billions of dollars. Okay, but this division that you're in, um, I'm a bit. Of, it's a bit of a, a strange one. They they don't actually have a division. Banks don't tend to do consultancies. What actually happened is I built and set up a innovation center for them, um, and so I've basically been allowed to go a little bit feral. Uh, what we could say is that the innovation center we bring in clients uh, specifically who want to use that venue or for me to help them. Um, and maybe that brings in, I don't know, $2 million a year. Okay. How many people do they have like you helping out or is it just you? Just me. I'm a one man band. Okay. So technically all the money should be yours, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tech, uh, yeah. Um, it, that would and be nice. You, but again, how does it benefit the clients? Uh, they've been very poor. What should happen is that, you know, because they're offering a value add service to their own clients, um, that they should be looking to uh, use the sales team effectively to, you know, because it's the corporate investment bank. So it's it's going out to your listed company. Let's just use one, Reuters, you know, Thomson Reuters. They should be going out to those types of clients and bringing them in and saying, we're going to do your strategy day. You can hold your investor analysis session. You can do whatever you want here. We'll run it. You know, that's what they should be doing. What they aren't, They're, they find that quite difficult. It's a bit of a mindset shift from selling financial services products derivatives to of course um, you know offering some sort of consultancy where you don't quite know what you're going to go and run so they've been poor so most of the clients have just come in via my own uh, connections or um you know referrals from clients that i've looked after okay can you get testimonials from these clients yes i can I've been okay. relatively poor. We can get a mixture of video. We can get some written testimonials. You just do the best as a heads up. High quality video, not like the shit you would want to shoot from your iPhone or your own camera. I'm talking about studio production quality does the best in yeah. someone's office environment. It has to be realistic. Okay, so I've tested this all out. Two, based on what you're telling me, this isn't a business that's going to do $10 million a year. Would you agree with that anytime soon? Uh, it's it's not because it's not scalable. It's basically me. Um, I don't see it as being scalable for you know a, a couple of years. Okay, so then what you should do is make the business your name. So it should be Colin. How do you say your last name? Isles. I so -L -E -L. Isles dot com if you can get it. And the reason you want to do that is you're going to be branding yourself, Colin Isles as the expert for innovation. So if anyone wants to hire someone, they will hire you. And funny enough, when it's a person's name versus a company name, you'll increase your conversion rates because it's personal. So when a company feels they're hiring an individual because they feel it's personable, they're much more likely to convert and close. Does that make sense? 100%, hundreds. And because they're working with you, your name, your stamp of approval, assuming you get the case studies and testimonials, I would just scale that up and do it on your own. Um, and to give you a rough fact, 
Um, have you heard of Apollo Group in the US? I, I'm guessing you're in South Africa based on your accent. Uh, I'm English, but I'm living in South Africa. Okay, so, um, you know, where are most of your customers? In South Africa? Yeah, the, the lion's share will be in South Africa, um, both because that's where the venue is, which is a cool venue to, you know, really help people, uh, you know, do stuff. Uh, and then it's just easier. Certainly, uh, I'm going over to TD Securities in Canada in a month or so, but I don't want to be traveling for the whole of my life. So, you know, 25 to 30%, that'd be really cool to do international stuff, but I prefer the majority for the moment to be SA, or at least that should be easier. Okay, so with everything that you're doing, you do it localized. So my buddy, um, let me close Skype so that way I don't keep getting messages. All right, so my buddy ended up um, working at Apollo Group, and I had a meeting with him. Apollo Group owns University of Phoenix, all right? And University of Phoenix is an online EDU or university. They're not that great, but they have a separate division that's doing somewhat well. It's doing better than the university. And it was uh, their corporate training division. One of their biggest divisions was innovation training, helping companies move faster, be more agile, think in the new ways, and get out of their blockers. Because most of these organizations have so many structures and layers, they just move really slow and they're just stuck in their old ways. And they're making so much money, it's hard to get them to change, right? Yeah. Um, what he ended up doing is within one year, that division generated over $10 million in corporate sales. What he found was he took what you were doing, he created the courses, made it into uh, information like video base, and he sold it per seat to companies. One of his first clients was General Electric. General Electric is all about innovation. They've been around for ages, right? In the TV commercials, they even talk about innovation. So if you end up going and you start selling per seat, <clears throat> you can do quite well. This is another avenue to make more money um, to think about as you're expanding. Because if they're able to do 10 million in one year, it shows the market size is actually quite large, more than 2 million, right? So, and I would brand it yourself. What I ended up learning from him, his name was Nick. He created a company called Skillshare, which sold to Apollo, and he was in charge of this division. And what he ended up telling me is they did really well in innovation because they found a person who was well branded, and they did this for each one. They did it for marketing, and thus they were discussing me with marketing. And they had it for every single thing, like security, uh, you know, uh, data science, etc. They would look for an individual who's well branded, and then they would sell from there because they found that that increased sales more than anything else. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Can I ask a related question? Yeah, you can ask anything. Fire away. So I've bought the domain Purposeful Organizations because a lot of these themes of innovation in companies, when you boil it down, is really quite simple. It's potentially the same for you as well. Companies and people that do really well, when they talk about grit and innovation and you know, 101 of the sort of factors that you should have to be uh, to be successful, at the center of many of these things is purpose. If you have purpose, it's so much easier to be successful, to have grit, to take cool decisions. Um, and that's the same at an individual or a corporate level. What's interesting is there's not huge amounts of information on this. It's uh, There's a few companies, you know, like the B Team, which is Richard Branson and a bunch of others. Uh, I think uh, one of the consultancy has just started to set up an R specifically focused on this, you know, purposeful idea. So I bought the domain because it, I was a bit surprised that it wasn't uh, already taken. The problem with it is no one's looking for that, even though they're starting to. So it's great that you have the domain name, but I would blog and put everything on your own domain name, which is your name. You'd be, you'd be way better in the long run with that. Yeah, and that was kind of the answer. I was, uh, well, the question that I was going to, you've answered without me asking. Yeah. So, so basically, um, keep, keep think the of it this way. Don't really do anything with it. And just push everything through in terms of SEO under my own um, my own my own uh, thing and just have a redirect. Yeah, for example, the travel space is huge. Hotels.com is not the biggest player. Expedia is bigger. Um, you know, Booking.com and Priceline are bigger. Tripadvisor is bigger. 
You get what I mean? Like you don't have to have the brand in your URL. And I found that it makes it harder to grow versus having a memorable name. Your name is more memorable. It's more personal. It creates more of an emotion than using a phrase in the industry. Got it. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll hand over for others. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Colin. Uh, I'm going to go to the next couple of questions, Neil, that we had gotten from email over the last week. So the first question um, is, what would you do if you had 10K to invest in SEO and content marketing? How would you spend it for the maximum ROI? Sure. If I had 10K to invest, that's actually a good one. Um, it depends. So let's break it down for B2B and B2C because they're quite a bit different. If I only had 10K, for B2B, I would go find the biggest bloggers in my space and work out deals where I can write articles related to my niche on multiple of these sites and have the keywords in the title tag and then have links everywhere to lead forms to my own website. Because what you'll find is these sites will rank extremely fast because they have so much authority and you'll constantly get leads from them. A good example of this is there's a guy named uh, Sean Duran in Orange County, California, the Los Angeles area. Mm -hmm. And I wrote an article about creating explainer videos and I linked to him on how it was affordable and how I got good results. That is where he gets the majority of his leads from. And I was like, wait, wow. if he did this for 10 other bloggers, and I wrote an article on a term that wasn't that competitive, but because my blog had so much authority, I ranked fast. If mm -hmm. I did that in the B space and I continually did that with all my money, I would generate a shit ton of leads over time. Because those posts continually rank and do well. It's like the best form of endorsement. Because unlike an Instagram post or a social media post, this post will always stay at the top of Google. Hmm, I see. Um, on the heels of that, the next question that they was asked was... Let me go answer the B2C version. Yeah, uh, of course. So for, mm -hmm. for, for the B2C version, I would go focus on content creation, like pain points. So if I was like doing yoga, I would write articles like the 21 best yoga pants for everybody, you know, 101 yoga positions, etc. As you keep writing content like that in B2C, and what you'll find is assuming you're picking decent topics and then you go and you find Facebook groups and channels and you get them to promote the content, which we'll go into later on in the course. Sometimes you have to end up paying them. You know, some of these, uh, I don't like paying them, but you know, sometimes you have to end up paying them. You'll get a ton of social shares. People find the content and they naturally backlink and searches indirectly are using social signals. And what you'll find is your content will rank and you'll get a consistent flow of uh, new sales from it and in B2B of course you can do content marketing and stuff like that but I'm assuming if I only had 10 grand and I couldn't do too many tactics and I didn't have a lot of time those are the strategies I'll focus on the first for B2B and the second for B2C. Awesome uh, on the heels of that the the next question was what would you do different if you had 100k to invest and how would you spend it? That's different. So anytime someone says, what would you with a hundred grand, 200 grand, or even a million, mm -hmm. I actually would still take that $10,000 increments and see the results and then go from there. See what people think with SEO is even if you know the formula, search engines react differently to different industries because of how competitive they are. So instead of burning all the money, I would just spend 10 grand chunks at a time and see what happens and then spend more and more. It's just like anything, right? Why would you want to put all your eggs into one tactic, spend it all, and then being like, oh shit, I just found out that if I combine the blog post with the Instagram, you know, influencer stuff and the funnel that Jared just showed on his screen, I'll make the most money, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a combination of everything because they all play into, together. Everyone believes, you know, like, like you just need to do SEO or you just need to do paid advertising or just social advertising. There is no really one channel. Sure, if I had to start all over again, I would pick just SEO, but eventually I would add in paid advertising, social media marketing, and all the other channels. Because when someone sees your brand everywhere, your conversions go through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, to share some 
data. One of my buddies works at one of the biggest travel companies. They own a lot of the properties that you guys all know. I can't say their name because then you would know their stats. And they do a ton of paid advertising on Google, so much so that they cap out on their budget every month. They tested out TV ads and branding ads on like social media and television, all this. As they were running, they found that their cost per click in Google AdWords went down anywhere from 20 to 50%. It just shows the power of branding. And to have a strong brand, you have to be everywhere. Branding helps with SEO, more brand craze, higher rankings. It helps reduce cost per click. It helps increase conversions when someone's on your site because they see you everywhere, right? The point yeah. I'm trying to make is you got to do a bit of everything in the long run, especially once you have That is really insightful. Awesome. So that is pretty helpful. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Neil. Uh, we have a next question. Actually, it's from Colin. And his question is, is it possible to be an SEO king on Wix or do you need the power of WordPress? <laughs> so that was an interesting uh, way of phrasing it. Colin, use WordPress. Do not use Wix. They're too limited. I'm assuming you're just starting out so you don't have much in SEO anyways. Um, switch to WordPress right away. Wix will not help you. It'll hurt you in the long run. I'm 100% sure on this. And keep this in mind. I got paid to go to Wix and give a speech to all of their employees. And I'm still telling you to use WordPress, right? That's my unbiased answer. WordPress hasn't paid me to speak. And I still would recommend WordPress. Okay. So I think that answered the question. Um, the next question that we had by email is, um, you started your business originally with your SEO agency, right, Neil? That's correct. That's my okay. first one, yeah. Uh, what are some early lessons that you've learned that you can share with the group? Uh, early mistakes, early quick wins that they would, you know, it would pay them to not do those mistakes or it would pay them to, you know, actually uh, get those quick wins for themselves. Anything that you can share with them that would be ideal. Yeah, one of the big things that I learned early on in my career is I tried doing too many things at once. It doesn't matter if it was marketing or business. Focus was a big lack of, uh, of, of mine, and I had that problem for many years. I still have it to some extent, but it's gone better and better. And I've learned that focus is what you need to uh, build a successful business. They asked Warren Buffett and Bill Gates you know, the same question. What's the number one thing that led to your success? And they wrote it on a piece of paper and they turned it over. And in their own ways, right, they didn't say the word focus explicitly, but what they both wrote pretty much meant focus. And that's the biggest mistake I made in my career. If I focus, I probably would be worth like, my first company would have been worth well over nine figures. My first company was never worth nine figures, right? Made millions of dollars, did well, but because I didn't focus, it never got to that nine figure, uh, range and it's hard to hit that right mm -hmm. the second mistake that i ended up making early on is i didn't realize that people should focus on what they're good at so for example you guys have all seen probably gary vaynerchuk he does an amazing job with marketing and videos now you guys are all good at something everyone tries to do what they're not what other people are doing and they're really successful at if I go and try to be another Gary V and create motivational videos being like, yeah, 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 you're amazing. This is what you need to do. You can crush it, etc." It's not me. I'm not going to do as well. And on the flip side, Gary's not going to do as well as me as content creation and content marketing because that's what I'm extremely good at. I know how to take content, promote it, rank it on Google. And I've done this time and time again. And I've even done this in countries and languages that I don't even speak, such as Portuguese and Spanish, and still dominated these markets because the tactics work. The point I'm trying to make is focus on what you're good at. And then, of course, as you get bigger and bigger, then you can adapt to other areas in which you may not be an expert at. But mm -hmm. at the beginning, really do focus on what you're good at when it comes to your business. That was really, really good. Thank you, Neil. Um, Apart from that, um, there is one last uh, question, which was about where do you hire devs to create your blog or your website? Sure, I hire developers from Upwork. Um, there's a developer that we use named, is it Dido or Vovo? Dido. Vignesh is Dido. Dido. Yeah. Dido, Dido is another one who can crank out blogs fast. 
Um, and those the main area, if you guys ever need an intro to Dido, he's actually pretty affordable. Um, just shoot Big Nash or anyone on the team, you know, an email and they'll do an introduction. Yep. Perfect. Um, that is all the questions we had that was pre-planned. Is there anything that you would like to say that we may have missed, you know, in the in the modules in the first week? You'd say anything that we uh, may have missed or anything you want to add to the current modules? No, that's pretty much it. I want you guys to keep cranking, stay motivated, give it eight weeks, implement the stuff I'm telling you and teaching you guys and you guys will be better off than where you are right now. I really do look forward to helping you. When I first started, other people would give me advice. That's how I grew. And I really want to see you guys succeed. Whether it's SEO, any form of marketing, or just general business advice, we're here to help. So just let us know anytime you have questions. And thank you guys for doing this. I look forward to doing this with you guys over the next eight weeks. Hey, Neil, did we talk about how all the materials are in the portal uh, right now, we're still editing the videos, but they can go in and there's a step-by-step -step instruction guide on how to get them through uh, Module 1, Lesson 1, and Lesson 2 so they can get started right now. Uh, yeah, that's good. And you want to go more in-depth on that, Derek? Yeah. So, you know. so yes, um, we have added all the materials in there for Module 1. And so in the Lesson 2, there's a step-by-step -step guide that will tell you exactly what to do and what materials to use to do it. So you guys can just go in there. You guys have access to it now. And then we are editing the video as we speak, and that should be completed um, in the next couple of days. So we'll be able to upload those videos so that you guys can watch those over and over. And then also there'll be audio that you'll be able to download and you'll be able to like listen to it on the go. So you guys will get that. And then each week we record everything live. So just give us a day or two to do the video editing and get it. Guys, each week. And then tomorrow we will be emailing you the course schedule for next week. Any cool. questions on that? Nope. Okay. So awesome. Um, yeah, we really look forward to helping you and we'll see you throughout the weeks. If you guys have any questions in the meantime, there's always a group, there's our emails. Don't be afraid to reach out. We really are here to help. Awesome. Uh, you also have access to the Facebook group, folks. So if you need any any help at all, please post on the Facebook group. Or if you need any support-related help, just email us at support at neilpatel.com. And thank you for attending today's session. And thank you, Neil, for sharing all the valuable lessons you've shared with us that you've learned over the years. And, yeah, we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye.